So today is uh, is uh, the class where, uh, where we're going to talk about the stuff that I've been talking about. So I, what I've done is I've brought a lot of stuff in. We're going to be talking about some of the things in the in the cases back here, uh, that kind of thing. Okay, so where we start looking at the stuff in front of you, you have to realize that everything here has a spirit. Everything on the table, everything in the showcases, the reason that the showcases are locked is because it's very, very spiritual stuff. The reason that we have sage around all of the stuff is to protect the spirit of the stuff. It's very, very important that we treat everything respectfully. Everything that's been brought in, there's been a pipe ceremony done for. All the pictures that you see, everything in the room as it is right now, and we're, we're probably half done with the room, everything in here has been uh, properly and respectfully uh, accounted for. The stuff that I'm going to do today, there's a lot of stuff yet I, I still haven't brought in because uh, what I did last night was I did a pipe ceremony to get some of the stuff together, and uh, what didn't really appear that should be here today isn't here today. So that's how those things are done. A lot of it is done uh, because of the way it feels when you're packing the bag. If you don't think it should be there, then don't bring it, right? All right, we'll start over here. Uh, there's all kinds of basic, what we call medicines that we use in indigenous cultures, especially around North America. Uh, this is sweetgrass. Sweetgrass root is really used a lot by the Lakota. The Lakota, the Plains Indians, use a lot of sweetgrass for a couple really good reasons. Number one is that there's a lot of sweetgrass around here, right? Uh, secondly, uh, this is a purification thing. One of the things that Indian people will do is you actually light the sweet the sweetgrass. You can break it off and, and sprinkle it over other medicines like sage, but it's a purifier. It's a cleanser purifier. Uh, it's it's uh, very, very powerful. Uh, when the sweat walks come in sometime, when we're talking about the sweat lodges, uh, some Indian elders and some teachers or people running the sweat lodge will rub sage on there and you inhale it, right? Because it's an inhalant kind of medicine. Uh, the other aspect of that is uh, the sage. Uh, what we do with sage is we use abalone shells. Uh, we'll actually uh, take part of the sage off here, uh, roll it up, put it in here, and, and light it. And then when the smoke comes up, think of the smoke like water. Uh, and, this, and you take the smoke over you, and the smoke will then cleanse you. Uh, sage, more of a cleanser from the Anishinaabe perspective. Sweetgrass, more of a purifier. Okay? Abalone shells, uh, you can get abalone shells practically any place around the country. Uh, we like to use abalone shells for burning sage. I also like to use copper uh, uh, for burning sage as well. We've got uh, one of these copper bowls in here, uh, hand-pounded copper bowl. Everything that we do, that I do anyway, is done with copper. When I'm pouring water in the sweat lodge, it comes out of a copper bucket. Uh, that's a small version of a copper bucket in here. Uh, I actually use a copper bucket that's much, much bigger than that. This is a small copper bucket. Uh, again, hand pounded. Uh, the copper bucket I generally use is probably about this this big. And we'll probably bring that in at some point too. It doesn't kind of feel right yet. In here, by the way, we have some medicine laid out. Uh, that medicine is uh, 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 bear root. Bear root is one of the medicines that uh, we use to create mishkiki wabu, medicine water. Uh, bear root is used a lot in our culture. It's not used a whole lot in the uh, Lakota culture, uh, but it is used. Uh, whenever we go to Sundance, by the way, we bring to Sundance a lot of the medicines that people at Sundance normally don't use. And they're very, very grateful of that. And one of the things that we do is we uh, trade a lot of medicines. For instance, uh, uh, the sage. We have a lot of uh, the smaller sage, uh, North American sage, we call it, uh, up where I'm from. So what we do is we harvest that every year. And we have a very, very strict way of harvesting it. What we do is we go out and we do a ceremony. We actually have sage fields up there. 
uh, and we get permission to go on them and things, and we, we pick probably between seven and 800 bundles like this. And there's a very intricate process. What we do is we, we bring them back, we, we uh, tie just the bottoms. Uh, of a, when we put about uh, a dozen or 15 together, then we hang them and let them dry for a month. Uh, and we do a ceremony before we leave, uh, make sure everything is smudged and cleansed, and uh, we'll hang them and uh, get them very, very dry. Then we come back together, we take the bundles, and we clean them up real well so there's no grasses or anything like that in there, and they're nice and clean. And then we, uh, we wrap them, and then we go back and wrap it the other way so we have nice, clean bundles. And we actually trade with uh, people all over the, all over the world. There's our, our sage is, is up in the North Pole right now, and we traded the sage for seal grease. Seal grease is something that they use a lot of for like sore knees, kind of like we use our bear grease. Uh, and they use it for uh, uh, burning in ceremonies. It's, it's, uh, it, it's one of these things that really burn for a long time. So, uh, so uh, a lot of trading is done. We also have, we have sage in Africa. Uh, we, we, uh, there's people there who send us versions of their sage and we send them versions of sage and, and so on and so forth. Uh, very, very common. Uh, this stuff is used a lot these days, more than you'll ever know. Uh, some of you may be thinking, well, I've never seen anything like that before. But if you go into indigenous houses, you're going to see this stuff all over the place. It's, it's all over. And uh, uh, very, very common use these days. We also have other medicines that we use in terms of herbs. Uh, this is bitterroot. Uh, this actually I bought. Uh, I usually don't buy it, but I was up in Bemidji and they've got a little store up there. Is it bitterroot or bitterroot? This is bitterroot. Uh, and I thought, well, I'm going to buy it just to see if it's the same stuff we use. And it turns out that it was. Uh, but otherwise, I, I generally, you can see it's still in the bag. It's probably been in, I probably had it for 10 years. <laughs> so uh, I, gen I just wanted to see if it was the same. So uh, bitterroot is something. Uh, if I have a toothache, uh, bitter root will take the, the tooth pain away. Uh, sometimes if you boil bitter root and stuff, if you get a bad stomach, it'll clean you out pretty well. Uh, it also uh, has uh, sores in your mouth. Uh, we use it for sores in your mouth. Uh, another thing that will, it's, it's kind of an oral thing. So bitter root is one of those things we use a lot of oral, orally. We'll, we might even make uh, bitter root mishkiki wabu to bring into the sweat to pour on the rocks. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's used a lot. Uh, in here we have swamp tea. We call it swamp tea. Uh, swamp tea is uh, it's gathered from roots of a certain uh, uh, plant that grows around swamps, as you might guess. And we also use the leaves. There's some leaves in there too, but the roots and the leaves then are boiled. Uh, has a pretty good effect on flu. Uh, if you've got flu issues, we'll use it for flu. Uh, that kind of thing. Uh, also, swamp tea is one of those things that is very, very common in a lot of modern medicines. Uh, a lot of the elements of swamp tea is in modern medicines. Uh, aspirin, for instance, uh, as what aspirin comes from is uh, willow, willow bark. And so uh, Indian people have known that for quite some time, and so we use aspirin, we use willow bark as aspirin, and it works very, very well. Uh, antidepressants. Many of the antidepressants actually come from plants in North America. Indian people have been using these kinds of plants for a long, long time. Uh, again, uh, there's lots of different variations and ways to use it. Actually, that doesn't taste very good. I mean, I, that's, that's the drawback, of course. It's a lot of this stuff, even though it's very, very good for you, it doesn't taste very good. For instance, uh, you know, sage tea. It, it, you almost have to gag it down, but if you recognize the nutrients and all of that kind of stuff in sage, uh, it's very, very easy to understand why it's used so much. Uh, also, remember when we talked about it, the closer to the sun you get, the more nutrients and things that are in the, uh, uh, in the stuff. I've got some mixed medicines in here. Uh, this bottom one is a mixture of sage, uh, cedar, which cedar, by the way, is, is huge in nutrients and incredibly edible. If you ever get lost in the woods, uh, find a cedar tree, because you'll survive if you can find a cedar tree. Uh, a cedar is full of nutrients, and cedar will keep you alive. Uh, 
when we're sun dancing and stuff, we'll suck on cedar uh, to help us get through the sun dance. Uh, when I was a little kid, they always told me to put cedar in my shoes because it will always help you walk in balance. So you can see the metaphoric thing that goes along with uh, the medicines as well. The bottom one, we've got uh, uh, a little bit of bear root, a little bit of what we call taki root. Taki root is a, a root that uh, is used for the uh, uh, anxiety, that kind of thing. Uh, it's kind of like the St. John's root, if you've ever heard of that. So they use St. John's root a lot for uh, uh, anxiety, uh, things like that. And uh, I'll use that when people are anxious before they go into a sweat lodge. If they're, if they're feeling nervous about going into a sweat lodge, then we, uh, I'll use some of that to help calm them down. It's amazing how well it works. Uh, in here we've got uh, bear grease. Uh, bear grease is uh, still good. Bear grease is one of those things that uh, uh, you can see. It's, it's just simply that it's bear grease. It's one of those things that you can uh, you you put on your uh, your shakers and, and things like that. Uh, before sweat lodges, as I said when we talked about sweat lodges, we put bear grease on our knees and on our foreheads if we've got headaches. Uh, it's a chemical and it works very, very well. It's also very, very explosive and I found that out the hard way. Uh, one time I, I went to a sweat lodge and I didn't realize that I having the bear grease in my trunk froze it. So I put it out by the fire to kind of thaw it out. It wasn't a very good idea. Uh, I mean, and it was bump, boom! And we were, we went outside and, and the bear grease had blown up somehow. Uh, I think that a spark might have fell in it uh, because I had it open. So uh, bear grease is uh, very, very effective, at, especially knee joint pain. Uh, it, what it does is it, it'll, it'll numb your knees. It's, it's a chemical, right? It's, a, it's um, uh, very, I mean, it's, it's kind of like petroleum, right? It's the same kind of thing. And uh, it'll numb your knees pretty well. Uh, so those are some of the uh, 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 kind of vegetative medicines that we use, the herb, herbal medicines. We have a lot more. This is uh, something that I wear to every Sundance, uh, and this is something that's really, really close to me. This is a medicine medallion. Uh, it's, it's simply elk on the outside, so you get the spirit of the elk when you wear this. Inside this particular one, there's sage, sweetgrass, um, uh, bitter, root, bitter root, bear root, and uh, uh, cedar. And so when I'm when I'm sun dancing, I'll have this on, and it'll it'll hang over my heart, and it helps me get through the sun dance. Uh, this has been every sun dance that I've ever been at. I've worn this, so this has got the power of you know, dozens of sun dances now. So uh, very very potent potent uh, medication. I'm going to talk in depth about uh, sun dances, but I will say a couple things about sun dancing. Uh, sun dancing is a sacrifice that Indian people make over a four day, actually over a 12 day period. Four days previous to the sun dance, uh, there's uh, cleansing ceremonies uh, where you're kind of weaning yourself off some of the caffeine and some of the foods and that sort of thing. Uh, and a lot of people have big meals before they go on sun dance. I don't. I, I like to be as empty as possible going into a Sundance and make that a complete uh, uh, kind of a detoxification period. The four days of the Sundance, you're literally dancing uh, for four straight days, no food, no water, in the hot sun all day long. Uh, and, uh, and it's a sacrifice. In our Sundance on the fourth day, we pierce and we uh, break from the tree. Uh, and there are many, many reasons and personal reasons and spiritual reasons why people would do that. And I, I'm not really at liberty to talk about a lot of those. Uh, there's lots of great music. There's lots of great ceremony that goes on uh, around the Sundance. Uh, one of the things that I find incredibly emotional about the Sundance is the sacrifice of the tree itself. I mean, and that's a big part of it for me. Uh, I get very, very emotional knowing that tree sacrificed its life to help the spirits of the people. Uh, uh, this is something I got as a gift of the first time I sun danced in Vermilion. Uh, so, and what it is is uh, it's a medallion also that you wear around your neck, uh, like so. Again, it hangs over your heart. 
Uh, it's made out of pipe stone, uh, and I, it's, it's pretty special to me. Uh, you know, it's got the four directions sign on there for the Lakota people, and uh, all that kind of stuff helps you. Every time you bring something into the Sundance Arena, it gathers the power of that Sundance. Uh, I've been to Sundances where people have tried to, like, take stuff from me, literally. You know, and they just want to touch you, stuff like that. Uh, they got kind of a vague understanding of what Sundances are. Uh, this is a Sundance skirt. Uh, one of the, I, I usually wear about uh, four of them. Uh, the Sundance skirt simply goes around your waist like this. Then it, you, I put a belt on below my belly. And this uh, folds down. So what you're doing then is you're, you're wearing the Sundance skirt. You're barefoot. Uh, you've got your medallions on and, and you've got, uh, and I don't have any of the uh, wristlets, anklets, or the headgear here, but you're wearing uh, headgear in that Sundance. It's usually sage wrapped with uh, red uh, cotton cloth. Uh, but I use the same, I mean, always use the same Sundance skirts. I use one particular skirt always to pierce in. I don't pierce in any other skirts. And that skirt is incredibly powerful to me. Sometimes when I have people who are really, really struggling in sweat lodges, I'll take that skirt and wrap it around their shoulders uh, to help them get through. Uh, going through some of the, uh, this little shop that was on the main street. Actually, it's not a little shop. It's a pretty big shop. All kinds of women's stuff, right? They, they cater to selling stuff to women. But I'm walking through there, and I'm, as most men, I'm not all that interested in buying skirts and dresses and all that sort of thing. So I'm, I'm, I'm you know, like most men, I'm pouting and wanting to get out of there and that sort of thing, and I'm being told to shut up and go look around. And so I'm looking around, and there's all kinds of little rooms that you go in. I mean, there's like dozens of little rooms, an old house or something. And I'm walking along, and all of a sudden, I just kind of glanced, tucked underneath some stuff, and there she was. And she was looking at me just like she is right now. And I thought, holy crap, what is this doing here? And they had it for sale. I mean, they, and I know how they do this, right? And it's incredibly cruel how this is done. Uh, they'll literally pull the, all of the, the tail and the feet out and the head out. Then they dunk it in this crap, right? So they're, they're killing it alive. I mean, they're, they're varnishing it alive. And it's really sad to me. And she, and she was just, she wanted, she had to go. I had to get her out of there. So I, I bought it. And, and she's been with me for a long time now. And uh, uh, she's very, very special to me, very, very spiritual. Uh, she doesn't miss. One of the things that Indian people believe in is that all things have a spirit, and of course, rocks. We talked about the grandfather rocks and the sweat lodge. There's all kinds of different rocks all over the place. This is uh, Amethyst, and you can get this all over South Dakota. Every gift shop in South Dakota sells this stuff. Uh, but what they don't realize is the spiritual significance to Indian people. They're just off to make a buck or two because it's pretty. Uh, the That's color, uh, the color purple, uh, represents uh, for us uh, two different directions, right? Uh, for us, in our tribal colors, the blue is the west and the red is the east. So this represents the mixture of Jock. Uh, that's the Crane Clan. That's the clan actually of leadership. And this is a Crane Talon. And uh, I use, actually use this in some of the ceremonies and things that I do. Uh, uh, crane Talon, very, very powerful. A crane is a huge bird, by the way. I don't know if you've, uh, you're familiar with seeing cranes, uh, but some cranes will have a wing spread that's, that's bigger than golden gold eagles. I mean, uh, crane, there's some cranes that have a seven to eight foot wingspan. They're, they're huge birds. Uh, so, you know, in order to recognize my dodem, uh, I always carry a, uh, a crane talon. Of course, this one is uh, my first name. This is a hawk talon. Uh, and, and whenever I'm doing uh, ceremonies that would involve the hawk or something like that, I always use this. We call the hawk gay cake. That's the uh, uh, name for hawk in uh, Anishinaabe. So, uh, and funny thing is, is I've got like a lot of these, and I give these away a lot. Uh, but this one I don't give away because it's the first one I got. Uh, pretty significant meaning there. If you notice, the, uh, the talons are sharp. Um, 
cranes are, or I mean, hawks, are, hawk does is it spreads its huge wingspan. Hawks, uh, a red-tailed hawk can have a six-foot wingspan, uh, but it spreads its wingspan so the snake doesn't know where to hit, right? And as soon as the snake makes an effort, the hawk is on top of the snake just like that. Rattlesnakes are child's play to a hawk. And of course, uh, the grandpapa and probably the most uh, significant symbol that we have in indigenous culture is the eagle and the eagle talon and many of the things involved with the eagle talon uh, are metaphoric. Uh, eagles are great hunters, so uh, great hunters in indigenous cultures will, may have a name eagle. Uh, sometimes the clan, uh, the, the default clan for the Anishinaabe is the eagle clan. So if you're kind of lost and don't know your clan, you will probably get put into the eagle clan by an elder through a ceremony. So eagle, eagles are very, very important. Uh, and we're, I'm going to be going into the eagle story in a different class one day, but we'll talk about why the eagles are, are that important. Shakers, uh, this was a gift to me. Uh, this, is a, this is a shaker that I use when I'm in sweat lodges and stuff. In our sweat lodges, the Anishinaabe, we use shakers a lot. Uh, the Lakota don't use shakers in the sweat lodges, uh, unless it's a special occasion. Uh, they, they'll bring drums in and sing because the prayers go up with the drum sounds in the Lakota and Dakota and Dakota and most of the plains. We, we don't quite do it that way, but we kind of do it that way too. We just use a, a lot of shakers. Uh, this is actually really loud for a little human shaker too. It carries a lot of foam. And this is, a, again, uh, a Thunderbird shaker, which is reminiscent of my second name, Maji Nge. So, uh, and it's also uh, a bird plant shaker, which is my plant. So, uh, I should mention too that I don't hunt birds. I'm a bird plant. That'd be like, uh, we would consider that uh, almost homicide to, to shoot birds if you're from the bird clan. People from the bear clan would never kill a bear. Uh, people from the eagle clan, of course, you don't kill eagles anyway, because those are relatives. Uh, and those are relatives that are uh, ancient relatives. I mean, the, the clan system's been along way, way before any, uh, any organized religion, which is fairly recent, by the way, has ever been around. So. Uh, those are very, very important connections to history. Those are very, very important connections to spirituality and very, very important connections to people. Back here we have some more different kinds of shakers. Uh, this shaker is, is from the Southwest. Uh, generally when you go into Hogan's, things like that, you'll use this shaker. Uh, the thing about this shaker is it's gourd. It's a gourd shaker, so you don't want to get it, you don't want to stay too long in like a sweat lodge because it'll get soggy. Right, and then it has to dry out again. So a lot of these shakers are, are used outside in, in different kinds of ceremonies. This one here is really, really old, too. Uh, and you can see that when it was made, they actually took the wire and went around and, and really did it the hard way. Uh, today, a lot of people won't really kind of do it the quote-unquote hard way. It, it's a lot quicker and a lot easier to, to do it simply. That's a board shaker. And by the way, when, when we're doing, when we make shakers, they're very, very special because uh, uh, inside the shaker is one thing from all four elements. Mother Earth, the vegetation, four legged and the two legged And the sound that it makes holistically as one uh, represents the coming together of those four elements. So when you're, when you're doing this, that's, that's a holistic kind of spiritual pulling together of all of those different kinds of elements. Uh, we have a very, very, very old turtle shell shaker. Uh, this was made in the late 1800s, and this found its way to me a long time, and it, I just now ended up getting a hole in it, uh, so I don't use it. So it's time to retire it. Uh, and the old man told me that the place to retire it is some place where people can learn about it. Normally, we would put this out, right? We'd do a ceremony and go deep into the woods and put it where nobody's ever going to find it. And that's where it would spend eternity. It would gradually become dirt, right? That's the same thing we do with sweat lodges. When we, when I, when we move a sweat lodge or something, we leave the old one where it is, and let it evolve back into nature. Uh, some people don't. Some people will take them down, that kind of thing. And that's fine. That's their tradition. Uh, but ours is to leave it. 
We have this uh, shaker. This came from Mexico. Uh, this was also a gift uh, when I was down in that area. A uh, little bit different kind of sound. Uh, again, it's a gourd shaker, so we don't take it into like wet, moist areas for any length of time. Same principle. Now, yeah, use it with music. Got a nice sound to it, I think. That kind of thing. Uh, over here is probably the, the prize. Forget about the beads on there. The beads are just plastic beads that were put on by the person before me who actually this, before this came to me. Notice it's, it's incredibly old, right? It's also a turtle shell shaker. You can see the back of the turtle on there, the 13 spaces. Uh, but it's also got a Thunderbird on there. So naturally, uh, this was a, a very, very special gift. It's incredibly old. It's been traced back to the mid-1800s when it was made. And it's, every time something is passed from person to person to person, it gathers the power of the person who possesses it. That's why the real old stuff is very, very powerful, because it's taken that spiritual medicine, just like when we were talking about the uh, uh, shell shaker ceremony, right? The, the, the baggage of that person comes with the spiritual element. So the thing that it's a very, very special gift if you get really, really old kinds of material like this. And this really means a lot to me. So uh, we also have this large uh, board shaker, even a different kind of. This is from the southwest, or the southeast, I mean. Uh, this is actually Choctaw from uh, down in the uh, south of Oklahoma, the south, the southeastern. Uh, part of Oklahoma. Uh, see the eagle feathers on there, uh, representing the eagle. And, and these, uh, this is actually a dancing shaker. They do the green corn dance down there, right? Which is a very, very sacred ceremony. It's like our the sun dance up here. It's like the Madeoan uh, Lodge and uh, for the uh, Woodland Indians, and so on and so forth. Uh, but theirs is the green corn dance, and what they do is they do their dances with these shakers, green corn. Dance. That's why it's longer. You hold on, you can hold on to it in your dance. Got a really, really good sound to it, too. Up here, we have uh, a roach. Uh, if you've ever been to a powwow, you've seen a million of these. Uh, roaches are uh, 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 part of the dance outfit that, uh, that the men wear. They use it when they're dancing traditionally. They use it when they're, uh, when they're dancing with fancy dancing. All kinds of ways to uh, uh, use the, the roach. Generally, there's a rocker, we call it a rocker on top of it, uh, where eagle feathers would be inside the rocker and you see the eagle feathers. Sometimes it's a single rocker, sometimes it's a double rocker. For fancy dancers, it'd be probably a double rocker because you know, you're out there kind of showing off. That's what the fancy dance is for. Uh, back here we have a dancing stick. Uh, actually, for the other class, I was actually demonstrating some. I, I kind of like walking around with a dancing stick during class, so I may start doing that. But uh, I also use this as a talking stick uh, when we when we do uh, talking circles, healing circles, uh, judicial circles, uh, all kinds of those kinds of ceremonies. I'll I'll bring this along. You can see it's got uh, uh, eagle feather, a uh, hawk feather. Uh, hawk tail feather, another hawk feather down here, and another eagle feather. And every time there's something significant that happens with this, uh, a feather is put on it. Feathers are very, very important markers. They're, they stand for who You get feathers when you do really, really good things, uh, especially eagle feathers, which are the most important feather. If we get to it, I'll, I'm going to tell that eagle feather story today. Uh, but uh, I'd look for me to use this more and more in class. It's kind of fun, too. Uh, down here we have some beadwork. Uh, I really have a lot of admiration for the beadwork. In the middle, these are kind of contemporary beadworks. Over here, a little bit older beadwork. Uh, I really, the people who do beadwork amaze me because I can't even see the damn beads. But I'll tell you, to sit and watch somebody bead is incredible. I mean, you see these women who are in their 80s and 90s who are putting together something like this which is unbelievably beautiful, right? And they're doing this in like a half hour. And they're just cruising, right? And it's like, how do you see the hole in there? I, I just don't get it. Uh, over here we have moccasins that uh, uh, you can see they have the Thunderbird on them. 
I got these moccasins back in 1968. And when I got these moccasins, they told me that one day I would have the name that represents a Thunderbird. They didn't know that at the time. And uh, my adult name came much, much later, and nobody knew about these. These are moccasins that occasionally I'll wear at uh, uh, ceremony. Uh, you want to have a, a, a good pair of moccasins, but these are incredibly spiritual moccasins. I wasn't even going to put them in here, uh, but I thought, you know, uh, it's good to show that the more traditional forms of beadwork. Moccasins are very, very old. They came somewhere around in the 19-teens. Uh, we're not quite sure. We can figure out that it is, it's in that area just by kind of the oral history of them. We're not quite sure. Huh? Oh, down here we have some uh, turtle shells, and I've already expressed the uh, how important the turtles are. Uh, this turtle shell in, in particular, I don't know if you've ever seen a bone throwing ceremony. Has anybody ever seen anything like that? Sometimes they talk about it with voodoo, which by the way is, is terribly maligned. People don't understand that at all. And it's been used in uh, movies and you know the voodoo dolls and all that kind of stuff. It's all crap. Uh, but generally it's a way to, it's a stop motion kind of thing. When you, sh when you throw, uh, in particular, uh, turtle bones in here, at that particular point in time, if it's like a picture. It freezes that point in time, then you analyze the bones, things like that. I actually have a board that I use uh, with, with different pictures that are set in particular places. It's ancient. We, we actually, that, that particular teaching comes from a pictograph in Canada. So what it does is you throw the bones and you analyze where the bones land in, uh, in, uh, in terms of where you are at that particular time. And it kind of dictates your future for you a little bit. So uh, that's, one of the that's one of the ways that we use that. Uh, we also have this one in here. This one's very, very old. You can see that the bottoms are even kind of separating out of it. Uh, very, very old uh, turtle shell. Uh, very, very spiritual. Uh, the old man liked to use this turtle shell, and, and this was a gift to me uh, after some kind of tough times at one point. That's how you do it. You give people medicine to help them through tough times. And this, there's always spirits in the medicine, that kind of thing. Uh, right here we have, a, a, it's actually a, a baby buffalo jaw. Very, very spiritual to the Lakota people, especially. Uh, a uh, great deal of significance with the uh, uh, spirit of the buffalo, all that kind of thing. And the Lakota, Dakota people are, are the buffalo people, the white buffalo calf woman, which you're going to be seeing and hearing more about. Uh, over here are the antlers that I actually use in the sweat lodge. Those are the antlers that have been used you know, hundreds of times uh, in, in the sweat lodge. Uh, over here, uh, we have the uh, sacred drum. Uh, that drum is a general ceremony drum. That's not a specific drum. I have a drum that I'm going to tell a story about uh, at, at some point here very, very shortly. We don't have time today. There was a gift from a naming ceremony. Uh, here we have a flute. One of, the, one of the things they do is play the flute. Uh, we have a couple of very, very old pictures uh, through here. And uh, we have uh, turkey feathers down here. Turkey feathers, by the way, uh, you know, the turkey was almost the national bird of this country. I mean, it was that close. I mean, they, they almost literally flipped a coin to decide which one. I mean, you've seen turkeys, they're beautiful birds. They get kind of a bad rap because they're named turkey, right? That, that sort of thing. We also have some pheasant feathers, which are uh, important for a lot of the tribes from here on south. Uh, Minnesota doesn't have a whole lot of pheasants at home, so uh, we don't really do a lot with pheasants. Uh, of course, we have some birch bark bowls. Uh, this bowl here is a um, Medeowin bowl. Uh, that bowl, I actually, we, I needed to do a lot of praying for because it's got uh, the bear on it. Uh, a couple uh, arrows up here. Uh, one of the arrows is, uh, uh, is, is significant. It, we don't know how significant, but we do know that it came from the 1920s, right? So. Uh, and by the way, a lot of arrows like that you see in stores and stuff, be careful not to buy those arrows because they, they pass them off as being real. 
and they then they paint them and they actually work them until they look almost real. Uh, that's a arrow quiver back there. Uh, it's an Anishinaabe arrow quiver. Uh, that was uh, actually a gift quite some time ago, and uh, and that's that means a lot to me because it's a symbol of, of warrior being a warrior. Over here, we have some contemporary forms of uh, decorative forms of dream catchers and stuff. Uh, actually, all of these were out at, we got at Pine Ridge. Uh, well, actually, Wounded Knee. We were up at Wounded Knee, and, and they have the vendors out there. And uh, uh, But these are just as legitimate as medicine. I mean, these are made by Indian people. Just because they're modern doesn't mean they're any less significant in terms of their spiritual significance. Down here, we have a, 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 a piece of a bear hide, a piece of wolf, and rabbit. I can't forget the rabbit because I'm a kid boy. Uh, all of them have incredible significance to them. Very, very, very powerful in terms of healing power. Back here we have a, uh, a rock that I'm going to talk more about. That's a Thunderbird rock. When we have, uh, and, and I get blamed for this now, right? One of the reasons why I'm getting blamed for this, which is nonsense, uh, is because when I came down here, we kind of stopped getting rain here, right? And what this is, is this is uh, what we call a Thunderbird egg. So if we have really, really bad weather coming, I'll do a pipe ceremony and set that out, and, and the thing is, is the storms will go around us. When was the last time Vermilion had any really severe weather? We haven't had any since I've been here. Not that I have anything to do with it, believe me. But it's kind of funny. And over here we have a, uh, a, a part of a uh, hornet's nest. Uh, hornets are, are very, very special and very, very spiritual, by the way. And don't forget, hornets have a very, very specific reason. Uh, bees pollinate this world. Make no if, ands, or buts about it. Right now, we've, there's a lot of fear that uh, uh, the, beers, the bees are disappearing at a very, very rapid rate. Uh, when, when my brother and I were kids, we were kind of silly. Uh, we had a yellow jacket. I don't know if you're familiar with yellow jackets. Fierce stingers. But my brother and I we had this old tree in our front yard, and we used to scoop out the yellow jackets and shake them in our hands. And whoever had the most stings, of course, won. And to this day, I think it's one of the reasons why I don't have problems with bees. I get bee sting to me is nothing more than a net bite. So um, then we have some Indian art in here. These are very, very special artists. The, the stuff that's in here, uh, this stuff, this one down here is very, very old. Uh, that was done in about 1910. Uh, up here we have some Indian artists. Uh, this is by uh, uh, Lyle Miller, who's actually a student here. Well, I don't know if you know Lyle, but uh, Lyle does some really, really good artwork. Uh, and, of course, the other artwork around uh, the room. That pottery over here, all pottery is very, very spiritual. Uh, that up there, by the way, is a wedding picture. Picture is my uh, Minnesota talk here. It's a wedding picture. Uh, and how that's used, by the way, is the man pours the water in on one side, the woman on the other side, and guess what it makes? You've seen the sand ceremonies that you know in a lot of weddings, where they put the sand in and things. Actually, my daughter did that. Uh, some of this stuff here uh, comes from the Southwest. Uh, I've got a lot of friends down in the Southwest. Believe it or not, if you could, even though this says, uh, especially these in here have a lot of spiritual significance to them, especially that little yellow, uh, that little white egg there. Uh, that's a, that's a Chiquita, uh, Chiquita, uh, Chiquita egg. And by the way, we do have a Chiquita doll. It's supposed to